So if you're Elon Musk and you're being widely accused of anti-Semitism, the single worst accusation you can face in the United States, by far, in terms of career damage and reputational detriment on elite levels, what would you do to stop that? You would fly to Israel and meet with Benjamin Netanyahu and promise to do anything he wants and agree with everything he says, and that's exactly what Elon Musk did today. Here is part of the conversation that they had, the one-on-one -on -one conversation they had on X about the Israel-Gaza war. Okay, what, how are they being trained to have these, to, to believe that murdering and having joy at the death of civilians is a good thing, um, and to stop that training? Well, I think you, you hit the nail on the head, um, because you have, we have a first a mission to destroy Hamas. Nothing's going to stop that, because... If you want peace, destroy Hamas. If you want security, destroy Hamas. If you want a better life for the Palestinians in Gaza who've been hijacked uh, by Hamas, destroy Hamas. Now, let me just interrupt there and say that for a long time, the biggest supporter of Hamas was Benjamin Netanyahu. And that is not a conspiracy theory. That's something Israel, the Israeli press has documented. Netanyahu allies admit this. Netanyahu wanted to prop up Hamas because they knew that if there were a more moderate face for Palestinians, it would put pressure on the Israelis more so than they have to reach a peace deal with the Palestinians and give them a Palestinian state. Whereas they knew if they had Hamas in charge of Gaza, they could use Hamas to demonize the Palestinians and turn public sentiment against a two-state solution. And that's what they did masterfully. They propped up Hamas. They worked in tandem, Netanyahu on one side, Hamas on the other. So when he says, oh, the key to everything is destroying Hamas, remember that the reason Hamas is so strong is because Benjamin Netanyahu cynically imposed them, helped impose them on the Palestinian people, even though there hadn't been an election in the last 17 years. Uh, all of that is a precursor to the question that you asked. You first have to get rid of the poisonous regime, uh, as you did in Germany as you did in Japan yeah. uh, in World War II. These were two... There's no choice. There's no choice. Uh, so, uh, that, that's this, a prerequisite. so there's Elon Musk saying, you're right, there's no choice, there's no choice. This idea, he, the reason Benjamin Netanyahu is trying to claim that Israel faced the same sort of threat that the world faced with Nazi Germany and Japan is because what did the world do in the face of the threat to Nazi Germany and Japan? It decimated entire cities and purposely killed and burned to death huge numbers of innocent civilians, including in Dresden, but many other places. And then the United States dropped two nuclear bombs on Japan to end the war. So once you can set up the framework, and of course, what the world did after World War II was it looked at all these atrocities that were committed in World War II, these targeting of civilians by the Nazis, but also by others and created a system of rules, fortified the rules of law to say, we don't want this to be done anymore. There are now laws against this. It's a war crime to collectively punish or to recklessly kill civilians. But Benjamin Netanyahu wants that to be the framework. Everyone's always fighting Nazis because once you're fighting the Nazis, anything and everything is justified. And here's Elon Musk saying, oh, you're absolutely, that's absolutely right. You gotta, you gotta do everything, everything. You can't care about civilian deaths. Just flatten it if you need to. Just get rid of them all. But, but then look at what happened. I mean, what you had in Germany was denazification, and what you had in uh, Japan under uh, uh, Douglas MacArthur was a cultural uh, reformation. Mm -hmm. uh, and Japan that you visit today is so different from Japan of the 1930s. Yeah. Germany that you visit today is so different from Germany of the 1930s. Well, is that possible in the Arab world? And I categorically say, of course it is, because we've seen it already in two places. We've seen it in the Gulf states, and we see that when you visit Dubai. So their model is the Gulf states, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Jordan. These are the most repressive, savage tyrannies on the planet. These are regimes that the United States funds and props up to prevent the population from ever speaking their mind. It keeps them under a thumb. 
to ensure there's no sense of democratic expression. Because if you have an, uh, an election in the Arab world like you did in Egypt, they're going to elect the wrong person from the perspective of the United States. The Egyptians, the first time they got to vote in decades, after living under the thumb of the vicious dictator Hosni Mubarak, who the United States propped up for decades, finally got to have an election. Remember when they all marched in Tahrir Square and we all cheered and we loved them for doing this, even though the dictator they were rebelling against was the one that the United States kept in power. And then as soon as they had an election, they voted for somebody, put into office Mohammed Morsi with the Muslim Brotherhood, who was a critic of the United States and Israel. And we couldn't tolerate democracy in the Arab world, so we had to overthrow him and impose a military junta led by General Sisi, who is at least as brutal and savage as Mubarak was before him. And then Mubarak does what he's told by the United States because he gets billions of dollars of every, every year by the United States like the Israelis do. He keeps the border with Gaza closed. And he doesn't allow the Egyptian people to have any democratic expression. That is Netanyahu's model for what he wants to do in Gaza at best. I think the Israeli intent is to drive the Palestinians out of Gaza so the Israelis can take it. There have been military documents saying that. That's the official position of many Israeli officials. But even the stated goal of what Netanyahu wants, the model of what he wants to impose on the Palestinians is pure dictatorship, just the dictatorship that does the bidding of Israel and the United States. Or when you visit uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, or when you visit Bahrain, you see something entirely different. Sure. There was, in fact, a cultural change there. Uh, and let me say that that same thing is, in my opinion, happening uh, to a considerable extent in Saudi Arabia. The de-radicalization of uh, these Muslim countries, these Arab countries, <clears throat> is, some of it already took place, some of it is taking place. Yeah. But there's another country with a very substantial Arab uh, minority where that is already taking place, and that's called Israel. 20% yeah. of our citizens are Arabs, most of them Muslim. Right. Uh, they serve on, uh, you know, in uh, high places in the academy, in the Supreme Court, in the Knesset, and so on. And I'm not saying that there, are, there isn't uh, some radicalism there, but mostly there isn't. Right. And in fact, they're integrated into the society. So we have to do the same thing. We have to demilitarize Gaza after the, uh, uh, the destruction of Hamas. And we have to de-radicalize Gaza, and that will take some time, especially work on the mosques and on the schools. That's where children are, you know, imbibe uh, their values. Yeah. And then we have to also rebuild Gaza, and I hope to have our Arab friends uh, help in that context. Yeah. I mean, I'm worried about Elon Musk that he might have strained his neck, given all the nodding he was doing when Benjamin Netanyahu spoke. And let me just remind you again, now, what Benjamin Netanyahu is saying, though, oftentimes you're not allowed to question or criticize it in the West, is vehemently criticized in Israel by people who hate Netanyahu. There are protests. Before this war happened, there were, Israel was on the verge of a civil war over Netanyahu. And even now, there are people who want him gone. Poll shows 60% of Israelis want that government gone. But if you're Elon Musk and you need to prove you're not an anti-Semite, you go to Israel and you nod your head when Netanyahu speaks, including when you're told that your power needs to be used to help us, Israel, stop there to be such a flow of free speech against us. As he told them in September, you need a balance in the West between free speech on the one hand and stopping hate speech on the other, hate speech toward Israel. Here is another part of this what do you want to call it? Lecture, uh, set of instructions, conversation, if you want to be super neutral about it. We'll take a listen. Well, uh, the one thing you cannot do is give immunity to the terrorists because they're hiding among civilians. Because if you give them immunity, everybody says they shouldn't be doing this. But effectively, nobody's willing to take the action to make sure that this is not an effective tactic. Because if it is, it'll repeat itself again yes. and again and again. By the way, Hamas says, we're going to do it again and again. But it's not only against Israel that they'll do it. This will spread very quickly throughout the Middle East, imperil the entire region. 
from there they'll go to Europe, and from there they'll also go elsewhere to America, whom they call the Great Satan. We're just the little Satan. <laughs> yeah, yes. America is the Great Satan. America is the Great Satan. <laughs> and this is an Iranian axis. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. It's absolutely. Iran, Hezbollah, uh, the Houthis, and Hamas. Yes. It's all part of that same axis that goes against Israel, the United States, uh, free civilization, and the modern Arab states. We're all on one side. This is classic neoconservatism that we've been fed for 30 years. If we don't pay for the wars that Israel has with its neighbors to let them destroy their neighbors, they're going to come to the United States. All of Israel's neighbor enemies are American enemies and the West enemies. Coincidentally, it's great for Israel. Just so happens that all the Israeli enemies, if you don't pay for Israel to kill them all and cheer, they're going to come to the United States and get you. Hamas is going to come to the United States and get you. That's what we heard in Iraq. And in every other war, oh, we have to fight them over here so they don't, we don't have to fight, we have to, we have to fight them over there so we don't fight them over here. Here is the president of Israel, the office of the president of Israel, that announced this, quote, in a meeting with, uh, in a meeting President Isaac Herzog held with Elon Musk and families of hostages, Rachel, Rachel showed Elon a video of her son, Hirsch. Badly injured, being abducted by Hamas. Mal Malki, father of another hostage, Omer, presented Elon with a dog tag inscribed, quote, our hearts are hostage in Gaza. Now note that Elon Musk didn't go to the West Bank and meet with Palestinians who have been killed in record number this year and since October 7th by maniacal, psychotic settlers who don't belong there, backed up by the IDF. They just killed three Palestinian teenagers in the West Bank for the crime of celebrating the release of those prisoners. The Israeli government told them, you're banned from expressing joy at the release of these prisoners. And the ones who celebrated were murdered by Israel in the West Bank. Elon Musk didn't go there. He didn't talk to those families. Obviously, he didn't meet with Gazans and hear about the 14,000 people and counting who have been had their lives extinguished, including more children or the same number of children now in the last seven weeks and were killed during the 20-year war in Afghanistan? Or more children in Gaza that have been killed in two years of Russian fighting in Ukraine? He didn't go meet with any of those. He met with only with Israelis, which is fine to do and I think he should do. But how do you get a complete picture if you're meeting with one side of a war? Here is... Elon Musk is a uh, response. Here is Elon Musk getting this uh, video presentation from Israelis about what happened on October 7th. That's the Israeli president standing over Elon Musk proudly with his hands clasped while he watches intently what he's being shown. Our heart is with our hostages in Gaza. Sure. So if you put it, I think it will be here. Thank you very much. And then in response to this dog tag, Elon Musk vowed on Twitter, I will wear it every day until your loved ones are released. I mean, honestly, this is sad to watch. This is sad to watch. And I think one of the important things that I think sometimes people don't stop and think about, Elon Musk is the world's richest man. On paper, he's worth $250 billion, a quarter of a trillion dollars. He controls massively influential and powerful companies, not just X, but SpaceX, which has more satellites in space than any, I think, than all governments combined. He has Starlink that can either provide or deny internet connection. He has Tesla, a pioneer in electric cars. He's in control of all these companies. So you might think he has FU money, where he's not subject to the influences and shame, where he can be forced to do things like this, these kind of penance rituals, because he got called an anti-Semitic. Anti You'd be very, very wrong for two reasons. 
One is it is a really strong human instinct not to suffer societal stigmatization and expulsion and scorn, where it's in our DNA. A couple thousand years ago, if the tribe expelled us, it meant that we would wall into a corner and die, wither away. We couldn't protect ourselves from the elements or feed ourselves or protect ourselves without our tribe by alone. And so the people who evolved were people who had a natural instinct to avoid that kind of social exclusion. So when you have every major newspaper in the West and major, major influential people accusing Elon Musk of the worst thing you can stand accused of in elite culture in the West, which is anti-Semitism, of course you're going to do everything possible to get out of that and to prove that you're not that, including running to Israel and in the most sycophantic way I've ever seen, meeting with these very controversial figures, Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli officials, and fully endorsing what most of the world has completely turned against. That's why Mark Zuckerberg, when the New York Times would run stories saying Facebook is allowing this material and Mark Zuckerberg has blood on his hands, Facebook would turn around and censor it on command. You would think Mark Zuckerberg's so rich, why would he care about being accused of having blood on his hands by the New York Times? It's because they do care. They, they want to be integrated into society. They like going to fundraisers. They like appearing at the White House. They like being embraced by society. And if you create a framework where you can make the public turn against them, they will desperately avoid that. That's what you saw today with Elon Musk, desperation to avoid that. But there's also a big financial price to pay. Twitter is a financially strapped company. It is not thriving economically. He paid $44 billion for it. It's not even worth half that, according to every estimate. It was barely sustaining itself with the cash flow it had. And now the combination of media matters and these anti-Semitism accusations drove away up to $75 million and counting in corporate advertisers. You have CNN out there trying to drive the rest away. And so here you have Elon Musk doing everything he can, announcing new censorship policies to protect Israel, running to Egypt, running to uh, Israel, but not the West Bank or Gaza or meeting with Palestinians and hearing about the immense suffering there. Thanks for watching this clip from System Update, our live show that airs every Monday through Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on Rumble. You can catch the full nightly shows live or view the backlog of episodes for free on our Rumble page. You can also find full episodes the morning after they air across all major podcasting platforms, including Spotify and Apple. All the information you need is linked below. We hope to see you there.